right, good evening everyone and welcome to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. I'm Gary Gunderson, Supervisory Archivist here at the Ford Library. We're very glad to have all of you here this evening, and I really do mean all of you. Uh, for those who are standing, we have one spot available up here. If anyone wants to be front and center, this is your opportunity. So you're welcome to come up and join us here. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few quick housekeeping chores. Uh, first, please turn off all cell phones and other electronic items. We are videotaping our program this evening. So when we get to the question and answer portion of our program, uh, please go to the microphone in the center aisle at the back to ask your questions. And please remember questions only and no public statements, even though I know you, you all are very interesting folks. Um, following our program, our speaker will be signing copies of his book. Uh, we still have a few copies available for sale, so if halfway through the program you decide it's a really good book, you may just want to kind of make a quick dash out back and pick one up. Uh, and we would also like to thank the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and Friends of Ford for their financial support of our program this evening. All right, on with the show. Uh, tonight we are hosting da uh, Dr. David Priest, author of the President's Book of Secrets, the Untold Story of Intelligence Briefings to America's Presidents from Kennedy to Obama, and now the official holder of the longest book title I have ever introduced. <laughs> um, in the book, of, uh, which uh, presents the first detailed account of the role played by the President's Daily Brief, or PDB, which contains the most sensitive intelligence reporting and analysis in the world today. At the heart of the book, are the personalities of those who produced and read the PDBs, the process of its creation and delivery, and the place held by the PDB in the daily work of national security at the highest level for more than 50 years. In the course of writing the President's Book of Secrets, Dr. Priest interviewed more than 100 senior U.S. policy makers and, and, and intelligence officials and conducted extensive primary source archival research at the, at the Presidential Libraries, including right here at the Ford Library as well. I should also add that we are the first Presidential Library to host Dr. Priest on this talk, which is only fitting since Gerald Ford was the per first president to request in-person briefings on the PDB. Uh, David Priest served during the Bill Clinton and George W. Bush administrations as an award-winning intelligence officer, manager, and daily intelligence briefer at the CIA, as well as a desk officer at the State Department. He obtained his PhD in international relations from Duke University and currently serves as director of, of analytic services for Analytic Advantage Incorporated. It's a great pleasure to welcome David Priest back to the Ford Presidential Library. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'd, I'd like to take you on a journey tonight, a journey of presidents and their top secret intelligence reports. Uh, to do that, a few thank yous first. Thank you to the foundation, thank you to the library, Elaine, your gracious host, uh, and thank you to all of you who have been here, courtesy of Kate Murray, who most of you do not see tonight, but she is behind the scenes making this all work. I'm gonna tell you the story of the President's Daily Brief, largely through the words of those who have been there through the presidents, the vice presidents, the CIA directors, and others who have been around this very special document. At the center of all of it is the president's daily brief, the president's book of secrets. This is a short daily document containing everything the president needs to know that day about intelligence to inform his or her national security decisions, and nothing that the president does not need to know, because it's in the very name, president's daily brief. The president's schedule is measured in minutes. There's not a lot of time for extraneous material. The PDB contains the most sensitive intelligence reporting in the world, delivered to the president in a timely fashion. The president's daily brief is delivered by briefers who fan out every day from CIA headquarters to deliver the book to the president and to the small handful of people that the president has designated to receive the book each day. The PDB is designed to help the president identify threats to national security before they become crises, and to help identify opportunities in the international arena 
as well. I've written the book we're talking about tonight, The President's Book of Secrets, ostensibly about the President's daily brief. But really, it's a story about a lot more. It's a story about intelligence successes and intelligence failures. It's a story about foreign policy opportunities and foreign policy crises. It's a story about presidential excellence and presidential arrogance. Let me start with a brief overview of how it all started. How did this uniquely American institution of briefing the president every day start? Then I'll walk through a few presidents with a little special attention to a guy named Gerald Ford before moving on to tell you how it's evolved since then. It all starts more than 50 years ago. John F. Kennedy came into office, dramatically different style than his predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower liked long stately meetings. He liked to have National Security Council sessions planned weeks in advance, months in advance, where they would methodically walk through international issues. And he would sit through briefings that were hours long. John F. Kennedy was the opposite in style. He could not sit through briefings that were in some cases minutes long. His staff had a very hard time getting him to sit still. They found he was literally rocking in his chair in anticipation. Sometimes they could not guarantee he would not just get up and walk out. They discovered that this was a problem. So they decided to try something different. They decided just to give him a bunch of written material because the guy liked to read. He was a speed reader. He went through the newspapers very quickly every morning. They figured they could do the same thing with intelligence reports. So they gave him a stack of top secret intelligence documents from the CIA, from the State Department, from the Defense Department, and other national security bureaucracies, put it on his desk. What they found pretty quickly is it sat there unread. He even said to one of his advisors once, do I really have to read it all? <laughs> it didn't take too long before they realized something had to change. His military assistant, Ted Clifton, seen in this picture, Ted Clifton invited in two CIA senior analysts and said, you've got to help me with this problem. He invited in Huntington Sheldon and Dick Lehman. I'll show you Dick Lehman because Dick Lehman ends up playing a role with the PDB as it goes forward over the next several decades. Dick Lehman, a CIA officer, is one of the people in the room. He hears Ted Clifton complain about all these documents that he has to sift through every morning to decide what Kennedy needs. He hears him complain about Kennedy not reading it. He pulls out document after document and shows Sheldon and Lehman, this is what I'm dealing with. What I need is something I can give to the president every morning that has only what he needs to know and not all of this stuff. And it doesn't have all the bureaucratic language that has corrupted all of these documents and make them virtually unreadable. And it doesn't have all the classification markings, the alphabet soup of T, S, G, H, C, all these letters that mean something, but the president doesn't really need to see. I need something that does all that. Oh, and, and this. I would like you to present it in a way that is small enough that he can just fold it and put it into his suit pocket. Because that way he can carry it around with him during the day. He can read it for one minute, get involved in a meeting or something else, and then an hour later he can pull it out and read the next item. That's what I need from you. Now normally, bureaucrats would be horrified by this. This requires a retooling of everything you do. Uh, Dick Lehman turned to his colleague, Ting Sheldon, and smiled because it was exactly the kind of thing he had been talking about to his colleagues ever since Eisenhower left office and Kennedy came in. He realized the difference in the president, and he realized that things needed to change. He already had an idea in his mind of doing exactly this. So right away, they worked up a prototype. They gave it to the president's military assistant. He loved it. The very next day, he took it to John Kennedy. It was a Saturday morning. The president was at his rented estate out in Middleburg, Virginia which had a swimming pool. Kennedy was sitting on the diving board between laps. Ted Clifton walks up to him and says, here's a new document we created for you. Right on the front cover it says, President's Intelligence Checklist, abbreviated P-I-C-L, pronounced pickle, which led to CIA being called the Pickle Factory for years. <laughs> John F. Kennedy looks at it, is pleased with it because it's got short items about international developments that he can process through very quickly, telling him just what he needed to know and not what he didn't. Of course, he doesn't get through the whole thing. He sets it down, goes back to swim a few laps before he picks it up again, exactly the way it was intended. It was a hit. He liked it. He started reading it. He started acting on it. He started directing actions based on what he was reading in his morning intelligence report. 
This is really useful, except when it isn't. And that was the problem. He was directing actions to the State Department, to the Defense Department, but the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense had no clue where these directions were coming from because they weren't seeing this document. It was the President's intelligence checklist, not the President's Secretary of State's and Secretary of Defense's intelligence checklist. So within six months, Kennedy made it so. He allowed the distribution of this document to also go to the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. That led to an interesting conundrum, though, because, going back to Dick Lehman at CIA, he was bureaucratically savvy, and he knew the law. He knew that the National Security Council, by statute, had four members. The President of the United States, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the Vice President. But the Vice President was not getting the President's intelligence checklist. So Dick Lehman, noticing this, goes to Bromley Smith, the Executive Director of the National Security Council, and says, what about Lyndon Johnson? The answer was clear and direct, under no circumstances. <laughs> and sure enough, for the rest of Kennedy's term, Lyndon Johnson did not ever see the President's intelligence checklist. This was a bit of a problem, a little bit awkward. Two and a half years later, Kennedy lies dead in Dallas. Suddenly, Lyndon Johnson is President of the United States. You're the Director of Central Intelligence, John McCone. You have to suddenly start talking to the new President, centered around this personalized document you've been producing for his predecessor, whom you did not like. Kennedy and Johnson did not have a loving relationship. You have to try to convince him that everything's going to be OK with us. He decided to use a dash of deception to get this point across. The afternoon of Kennedy's assassination, John McCone, the Director of Central Intelligence, had one of his assistants call Johnson's White House and say, will the President want his regular 9 a.m. intelligence briefing tomorrow morning? The odd thing about that is there had been no such regular intelligence briefing. Kennedy had not taken in-person briefings from his CIA officers. He had been reading the President's intelligence checklist. McCone was taking a gamble. He was gambling that Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy were far enough apart that Johnson had no clue what Kennedy did with his intelligence. He gambled and he won. Johnson said, of course, I want the regular briefing. So they start the regular briefing starting the next morning at 9 o'clock. That continued for some time, but over time it became clear that Johnson didn't really take to this product. He took the briefings less and less often. His advisor said he doesn't even appear to be reading this new product that much. Now, that could be due to the fact that he figured out he was, he was no dummy. He probably figured out that this is something that Kennedy and his senior aides had been getting and not letting him in on. It also wasn't fit to his personal style. It was written for John F. Kennedy. So it didn't take CIA officers too long to realize they probably should adjust, and they did. In November 1964, they started working on a new product. They renamed it, they reformatted it, they made it a full-size document instead of this oddly square-shaped document that would fit in a suit pocket. And they gave it to Lyndon Johnson for the first time on December 1st, 1964. They called it the President's Daily Brief. And that is the name that has stuck with this daily document that has gone to presidents all the way through to President Obama this very morning. But did Johnson read it? He wasn't reading the President's Intelligence Checklist much. How do we know he was reading the PDB? Well, that's how. I got a picture of him reading it. In his robe with Lady Bird and one of their grandkids. Don't know how that kid got a security clearance. But <laughs> clearly absorbed by the material inside the President's <laughs> daily brief. Johnson loved it. His advisors gave feedback that he was reading it avidly. This was what he wanted. Part of that was due to the very delivery mechanism. Lyndon Johnson had a habit of reading a lot of his serious documents late at night, sitting in bed. For hours, he would have a stack of night reading that he would go through. So, the CIA adapted to the personality of the president. Just as they had created the pickle for Kennedy, they changed the timing of the delivery for Johnson. And they started delivering it late in the afternoon, so they could get into his stack of night reading, and he could read his president's daily brief at night. Lyndon Johnson's successor, Richard Nixon had a different take towards the CIA than most presidents. Uh, vitriol, hatred, <laughs> disparagement, uh, those are the nice words. 
Uh, he did not, he and his new national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, did not have a lot of kind things to say about the CIA. They thought it was just full of uh, a bunch of liberals who were presenting the New York Times editorial page point of view in the intelligence. And so they didn't really take to the PDB very well. They kept foreign policy decision making very close to their chest. In fact, Henry Kissinger decided as the administration started, he was going to take control of the intelligence going to Richard Nixon. Instead of allowing the president's daily brief to go unfiltered and unseen to Richard Nixon every morning, he decided that he needed to get it the night before Richard Nixon would see it. And one of the aides pointed out to him, you realize if you insist that it's being delivered to us at the White House for you personally to look at it so that you can put a cover memo on it with anything you disagree, if you insist on that, it's going to have information that's 17 hours old by the time the president sees it. Kissinger said, fine. That was a price he was willing to pay. He figured it could be supplemented with other material or he could offer the overnight material. But it did introduce a real lag in the information getting to the president. By 1974, the winds of Watergate were blowing. It was becoming pretty clear to most people that President Nixon was not going to see through his second term. By then, we had Vice President Gerald Ford. Vice President Gerald Ford was not receiving the PDB as soon as he got to become Vice President. It was when he was taking a tour of CIA headquarters in June 1974 that he became aware of it. He was out there getting briefings and meetings, and the Director of Central Intelligence, Bill Colby, either in a stroke of genius or very good luck, decided that after the briefings, he would walk Ford through the building. They walked, poked in a couple offices, showed him some fun stuff to look at. One of the offices they walked through was the Office of Current Intelligence. Current intelligence is a term that in the intelligence business means intelligence that's produced quickly for policymakers to act on on immediate issues. Not long-term papers that take years to produce, but short-term things like the President's Daily Brief. And sitting out there, in the office of current intelligence is the president's daily brief. Ford happens to notice it, says, what's that? Colby says, why, that's the president's daily brief. That's going every morning to President Nixon and Dr. Kissinger, and uh, would you like to see it? <laughs> well, yeah, sure, sure I would. Can I see it? He actually offers Vice President Ford, without vetting it with the president, he offers Vice President Ford the PDB and offers him something that no other president or vice president had taken to this point, and that is a daily personal briefer, a CIA officer whose only job was to take the material to the customer and brief him, bring back the feedback, and get some insight into what that customer might want the next day. Ford immediately accepts. And from that point forward, he starts getting daily intelligence briefings at his house in Alexandria, Virginia, right there at the kitchen table, or in the limo ride downtown from his house. Either way, this is a big step forward for intelligence, because now the intelligence is meeting the customer not only in a written product, but in a written product plus a discussion that allows the answering of questions on the spot instead of a day later in a memo. It allows exploration of alternatives. It allows some of the information that was left on the cutting room floor in the production of this written document to get into the head of the policymaker. Gerald R. Ford ended up, of course, as president in August 1974. He decided, despite the pressure on his schedule, to keep the daily intelligence briefings. Thus, Gerald Ford became the first president, as president, to receive working level intelligence briefings from CIA officers to talk about the PDB. Of course, the real estate changed. His briefer, Dave Peterson, stopped going to the kitchen table in Alexandria, Virginia, and started going into the Oval Office. Nice step up. The very first briefing, right after Ford became president, went very well by all accounts. Dave Peterson said the material itself was communicated clearly. People in the room, which were only Gerald Ford and Al Haig, agreed that it went well, until it didn't. And that was at the end of the briefing, when Dave Peterson walked out of the room, found himself trapped in a small hallway with a locked door in front of him, which he only later learned was the president's private office. He had left through the wrong door of the Oval Office. <laughs> he was now trapped inside that passageway. 
He had no choice but to timidly return to the Oval Office, where he found Ford and Haig laughing. <laughs> but Ford, being the genial man he was, immediately shifted from laughing to saying, the first time I was in this office, I did the same thing. <laughs> it made Dave feel much better. Gerald Ford introduced some real security into the President's Daily Brief process. Back in the Nixon administration, copies of the President's Daily Brief had, had floated around a bit. But when Gerald Ford was reading it, he read it in the Oval Office. He would sit there, talk about it with Dave Peterson. Often in attendance would be Brent Scowcroft, the Deputy National Security Advisor. And then he would often just give it back to the briefer to carry back to CIA headquarters. If there's anything particularly sensitive in it, they would actually staple in a piece of paper into President Ford's copy so that he would see it. But even all of the managers at CIA headquarters wouldn't see what was going to the president. That allowed them to put some pretty sensitive stuff into the president's daily brief. One person was not seeing the PDB early in the morning via the same fashion. That was Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. He was still dual-hatted at the time, Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, but he started each day at Maine State instead of at the White House. He was not at the briefings that Dave Peterson was giving to President Ford and Brent Scowcroft. What would happen is Kissinger would go to the White House later in the morning. Ford loved this because reading the PDB and getting the briefing helped him get prepared for the meeting with Henry Kissinger on all things international. Kissinger would read Scowcroft's copy when he got to the White House to figure out what the president had been told. That didn't last too long before Kissinger started taking a copy back at the State Department so he could get ahead of things as well. One other quirky thing about the Ford administration was somebody who attended the briefing. For the first time in PDB history, you had a regular attendee at the PDB briefings other than the president and the national security advisor. Uh, and probably the first one who routinely attended the sessions naked, on four legs, <laughs> with a tail. <laughs> the president's prize, golden retriever, Liberty. Uh, she would attend the briefings and would enthusiastically pace around between Dave Peterson, Brent Scowcroft, and Gerald Ford. Um, so much so that it became a problem. During one briefing in particular, the most animated that Dave Peterson remembers Gerald Ford ever getting in a PDB briefing was when Liberty was enthusiastically walking around the room trying to get petted by everybody. Dave Peterson reaches over, scratches her behind the ears. She loves it. She loves it a little too much. She starts wagging her tail enthusiastically, rattling and nearly knocking over Gerald Ford's prized pipe rack. <laughs> the clattering disturbed the president so much he banished Liberty from future PDB briefings. Let me mention one other person in the administration before I move on quickly to some other presidents and then take questions from you. Vice President Nelson Rockefeller. He comes into office and he is also not seeing the PDB right away. He's kind of busy because almost from the beginning he is heading up what became known as the Rockefeller Commission, looking into the domestic activities of the Central Intelligence Agency. He's much more focused on covert action that happened decades ago than he is in the current intelligence especially because the role of the vice president then was much more about attending funerals and heading down to Capitol Hill once in a while, not the full scope advisor that it has become today. But Nelson Rockefeller eventually starts getting the PDB. Rockefeller gets it briefed in a unique way. He does not get a CIA briefer. He has a CIA courier deliver it to his own national security advisor, John Howe, who ended up becoming deputy national security advisor in the Bush 41 administration. Uh, John Howe told me every day he would get the PDB, he would take it into the car, he would brief Rockefeller as he drove downtown, and sometimes continue the conversation afterwards. CIA agreed to this, letting somebody else brief the PDB, because that's the way the customer wanted. it. And that really is a theme that cuts across the delivery, across the decades of the President's Daily Brief. The way the customer wants it, once that is determined, is the way the President gets it. President Kennedy folded in his pocket. President Johnson reading in bed at night. Gerald Ford with a briefer in the room. I have no doubt that if a president decides, I want to get the PDB in interpretive dance, <laughs> there's going to be a whole lot of CIA analysts learning how to dance. <laughs> Skip forward to Inauguration Day 1977. Jimmy Carter enters the Oval Office. Jimmy Carter, the very first day 
had Dave Peterson of CIA bringing him the PDB. And this was unique, not only for Jimmy Carter being his first day in office, but, but also for Dave Peterson, because after the first year of the Ford administration, Gerald Ford had stopped getting those in-person briefings from Dave. What happened is he decided, number one, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty up to speed. I feel like I'm okay on this international stuff now. Number two, he was starting a very tough election campaign. It had become clear Ronald Reagan was gonna challenge him for the nomination in 1976. He was spending a lot of time on the road. It was very hard to keep the schedule of a daily intelligence briefing. So that first day with Carter, Dave Peterson is back. He gets the PDB to Jimmy Carter. It was the very last time that this would happen in the four years of the Carter administration because of the other man you see in the photo here, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who decided he also would take over the intelligence business, much as Dr. Kissinger had done with Richard Nixon. Dr. Brzezinski actually pulled a nice bureaucratic trick on this, too. Stansfield Turner ends up becoming the director of central intelligence for Jimmy Carter. He is the president's chief intelligence advisor. He finds out that the president really likes the PDB, and he says, well, you know what? He really likes the PDB. I'm the president's chief intelligence advisor. Why am I not briefing him every day? Why is it a part of the briefing that this guy is giving him? So he goes and challenges him and says exactly that. I'm the president's chief intelligence advisor. I should be giving him the PDB. Brzezinski goes to the president's schedule, where it says intelligence briefing every morning. He goes to the intelligence schedule, crosses out intelligence briefing, and writes in national security briefing. It says this is resolved. And he just incorporates the PDB into the national security briefing, which of course, as national security advisor, he owns. So Stansfield Turner never got in to see the president on the PDB. They had plenty of other briefings together, lots of other time talking about the implications of the analysis within the PDB but no direct briefings. The other interesting thing about the Carter administration and the PDB, Jimmy Carter, like Gerald Ford before him, felt very strongly about the security and the sanctity of the document. So Jimmy Carter held on to it tight. In fact, his copy of the PDB, which he would often scrawl in, write notes, make questions, that was the very copy that the vice president saw. The vice president didn't even get his own copy. Walter Mondale, got the copy later in the morning after the president was done with it, they passed his very copy to the vice president. That's interesting for two reasons. One is it didn't mean there were a lot of copies floating around. It was a lot more secure. But number two, what great insight as the vice president to see what the president is thinking about this intelligence. It helped Mondale become a stronger vice president and a, around, the, around the world advisor in many ways for Jimmy Carter. Next president. Ronald Reagan. Conventional wisdom has it that Ronald Reagan was not much of a reader, certainly not of top secret intelligence reports. Uh, conventional wisdom is wrong in this case. We can bust this myth. And we have two reasons for doing that. One, CIA historian went through the first thousand or so PDBs of President Reagan's term. And he found that there were markings on many of them, not the majority, but many of them, things like underlines of certain words, brackets around certain concepts, exclamation points to highlight things. And then occasionally a question in the margin or a comment about something, even circled typos, things that got through the editing gauntlet, Reagan would find and circle, as Carter had done before him. Uh, that is not the mark of somebody who does not read the PDB. Secondly, they found out that Reagan read it because his diaries showed that. If you go through his diaries in detail, which I did, <laughs> you, you will find that in those hundreds and hundreds of pages, there are frequent comments about the daily intelligence, sometimes referring to the PDB or the president's daily brief by name. And this is his personal diary. So there's evidence that he was reading it, that he was paying attention to it. He also received supplements to the PDB, like videos. Videos about world leaders. And in fact, he noted in his diary about one leader, he said, after watching the video the CIA produced to supplement the PDB, I, I feel like I've met him before. And that really is the purpose, to give the president that advantage before going into a meeting with a foreign leader. He was not the first, however. Jimmy Carter had had videos presented to him. Earliest person I could find that had a video presented to him was Gerald R. Ford, getting a video of Brezhnev, the Soviet leader. So Reagan seems to have carefully read it, but others were not so careful in his administration. It reverted back to the pattern 
where it floated around the West Wing quite a bit. A lot of copies were requested, a lot of copies were sent to the White House. In fact, some people at the White House made photocopies of it. One senior official made photocopies of the President's daily brief containing top secret intelligence, took it home with him and stored copies in his garage. The National Security Advisor found out about this, had them promptly returned and destroyed. This disturbed one person more than anyone else in the administration. That was Vice President George H.W. Bush. George Bush had been Director of Central Intelligence. He knew how important it was to get this human intelligence sourcing in the PDB. He knew that people's lives were literally at stake to get some of this information. And he saw it floating around the West Wing. He said, it really disturbed me. He told me it upset him when he found out about this. And he took measures talking with the Director of Central Intelligence to try to walk this back. Perhaps because he felt so strongly about this document as Director of Central Intelligence, as Vice President, and then as President for four years, I think that's why he agreed to write the foreword for the book that I'm talking to you about today. But in the foreword, he didn't want to talk about himself. George H.W. Bush wanted to talk about the men and women in the Central Intelligence Agency who had produced this book for him, who never get credit for the work they do. Just the kind of guy he was. He, of course, becomes president. George H.W. Bush picks up on the habit that Gerald Ford had started back in 1974. And he takes it a step further. George H.W. Bush takes an in-person briefing from a CIA officer up in the corner, you can see him, Chuck Peters, along with Judge William Webster, Director of Central Intelligence, John Sununu, Chief of Staff, Bob Gates, Deputy National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft, National Security Advisor, also Ford's National Security Advisor. This was the usual briefing setup. In the Oval Office, the President would receive the PDB, which he's flipping through here. The CIA briefer would talk through the items, give some supplemental information, highlight some things for the president. They would have a discussion about the implications and move on. Basically what Ford did with a slightly larger audience. But the thing that was different here is he did it through his whole term. Every working day in Washington, George H.W. Bush took a PDB briefer in person. He took it very seriously by all accounts. It was a very intense discussion. I mean, imagine the firepower in this room. You got somebody who's been national security advisor now twice. Bob Gates was no slacker himself. He grew up as a CIA analyst, had been working on intelligence for decades already. Briefer had his work cut out for him, but the briefer also had some fun. The briefers for George H.W. Bush remember the very serious moments, like going to war against Iraq when Kuwait had been invaded, like trying to end the Soviet Union without a war. But they also remember some lighthearted moments. One case in April 1990, President George H.W. Bush read in his PDB about the upcoming election in Nicaragua. Daniel Ortega was opening up the country to democratic elections. The analysis in the PDB was that Daniel Ortega, he controlled the institutions of state power. Of course he's going to win this election. Bush looks at the piece, looks up at his briefer, looks at the piece, looks up at his briefer, says, I'll bet you an ice cream cone that you're wrong. Now imagine yourself, you're briefing the President of the United States. He wants to make a bet with you, a dessert bet over top secret intelligence. Uh, what do you say? Yes, sir. I'll take that bet. And you stand up for the analysis in the book presented to him. Uh, you do that, and the next day you walk into the Oval Office with an ice cream cone because the President was right and the analysis was wrong. That's the kind of thing that they were able to do. He was comfortable enough with the book. He was comfortable enough with intelligence that he could both take it seriously and have some fun with it. His successor in the Oval Office, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had an ebb and flow with the President's daily brief over his eight years in office. Sometimes he would take in-person briefings. Often he would not. He found hard time keeping to a set schedule. He would schedule meetings and he would get so involved in whatever the issue was that his advisors saying, Mr. President, Mr. President, we're out of time. They're like, no, no, we're going we're to talk about this some more. Mr. President, we're now 10 minutes late. Yeah, we got at least 10 more minutes. Mr. President. And his schedule would keep getting pushed back. They said Clinton operated on what they ended up calling it Clinton time because it didn't track with any known chronological device in the room. <laughs> Clinton could not hold to his schedule, so the briefer 
stopped getting in to see him regularly, but he did still read the book very seriously. He read it voraciously, but the book also exasperated him all the time, he told me, because it never had the level of detail he wanted. He was making, by definition, if it gets to the president's desk, by definition, he was making the toughest decisions in the national security world, or else it would have been worked out at lower levels. And he wanted clarity. Well, that's not what intelligence does. Intelligence doesn't give you a perfect picture. It bounds uncertainty. Perhaps it reduces the amount of uncertainty, but it can't give you point predictions on everything. That was frustrating to him, but he understood why. He understood that's the business of intelligence. But he did tell me about a very useful time with the PDB, one that actually helped avert a nuclear war. In July of 1999, one of the periodic conflicts between India and Pakistan and South Asia was flaring up again. It was bad. Pakistan had gone across what was called the line of control, was egging on the Indians, and the Indians were shooting back. It was a no kidding shooting war. The problem was both countries by this point had nuclear weapons. And we have two countries with nuclear weapons actively shooting at each other. This could go badly. The Pakistani prime minister realized this. He had gotten himself in over his head. He knew he had to find a face saving way out. He came to Washington, July 4th, 1999, to try to get Bill Clinton to save him to try to get Bill Clinton to say, yes, we will help you, Pakistan, get some of what you want in order to give you a way to save face and get out of this mess. Uh, Bill Clinton wasn't having it. He was not going to reward the Pakistanis for starting a conflict. But what troubled him is the morning of that meeting, he read his president's daily brief, and in it was an article telling him pretty clearly that the Pakistani and Indians did not have perfect information about each other's intentions and capabilities. That's a real problem when they're shooting at each other. He ended up having a meeting with the Pakistani Prime Minister and he brought up this article with him. And he said, do you realize your own military might be arming their nuclear missiles right now? The Prime Minister was, was shocked. It enabled Clinton to get through his head that he needed to pull back, that he needed to walk back from the cliff. And maybe this helped avert a nuclear war in and of itself. But he also had some fun with the PDB like his predecessor had. In fact, one morning on his 50th birthday in 1996, he opened up the PDB and Bill Clinton started reading about all of these crises that had erupted overnight. The things he had specifically said and done in the previous weeks and months, every article in the PDB was telling him had led to wars, famines, and other catastrophes everywhere in the world. And page after page he's turning thinking, the world can't be this bad. And it took him a few articles before he realized the whole thing was a joke. It was a birthday PDB produced for him <laughs> to make him think he was responsible for the world's collapse. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing was, it had happened before. He said he was used to getting these on April 1st. Because on April Fool's Day, the CIA had been producing this kind of joke PDB for him. Totally took him surprise on his birthday. Let me move forward to George W. Bush. George W. Bush takes office and he does two things that take his daily intelligence up a notch from even what his father had done. He takes a daily briefing from a CIA officer every day. That's the same as his dad did. That's the same as Gerald Ford did for a year. But he takes it up in a, no a notch in two ways. One, he starts taking a CIA briefer with him everywhere he goes. Domestic trips, foreign trips. If the president is traveling and he's not gonna be in Washington, at the right time of the day to get a briefing, he's got a briefer going with him, including on the morning of September 11th, 2001, when the president is giving a speech at an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida, to highlight his education program and to read a book to children. He has a CIA briefer with him. This famous photo, after some planes flew into some buildings, shows what most people thought was that guy who is always with the president who carries that briefcase, the football, that carries nuclear codes. The man standing here with a very serious look on his face, holding a briefcase. No, that's Michael Morell. That was his CIA PDB briefer. What's in the briefcase? Not nuclear codes. It's the top secret president's, intellig president's intelligence report, the Book of Secrets. Michael ends up going around with the president all day. You may recall that day, the president took Air Force One around the country on a little tour. Went to Louisiana, went to Nebraska before coming back to Washington over the objections of the Secret Service. 
because he felt he needed to be back in Washington. Uh, Michael Morell was with him the whole day, serving a role as a communication conduit from CIA headquarters on what they were already discovering about al-Qaeda's role in the plot within hours of the attack. So that's one way he took the PDB briefings up a notch with the briefers. The other way he took it up a notch was in the second term. You might recall that in the second term of the Bush administration, there were some issues with what was going on in Iraq. It wasn't going well. And he was being reminded of this every day in the president's daily brief. The theme of the president's daily brief across the decades is truth to power. It's an objective assessment of what's going on, not what the president wants to hear, but what the president needs to hear. And what he was hearing wasn't good. The situation in Iraq was not going well. The president can make two fundamental choices at that point. If the steady drumbeat of information coming to him is not going well for his policy, he can say, get out. I don't want the intelligence anymore. Or he can do what George W. Bush did. He said, I want more. He actually started inviting intelligence analysts in to brief him in what he called deep dives. That is, on top of the president's daily brief, he started having analysts come in to talk about a specific topic for 30, 40 minutes on a very narrow slice of a particular country or a particular functional issue around the world. In the first 18 months after doing this, more than 200 intelligence analysts had come in to do the deep dives with him. The current president, Barack Obama, we don't have as much information about Barack Obama's use of the PDB because he is, after all, the current president. And information about how a current president receives intelligence is, rightfully, more protected. We do know one thing about the way he reads his daily book of secrets. He reads it on an iPad. He no longer gets ink on paper in a binder, albeit a very nice leather one. No, he gets electrons on a screen. What's interesting about this? The basic idea of giving the president something electronic instead of something paper had been proposed in 1970. Henry Kissinger got a memo from one of his National Security Council consultants saying, you know, we got this idea. Here's what we could do. We could create this thing, a, a monitor, and we could put that on the wall in your office, and we could put this thing in front of you. We call it a, a keyboard. And there could be a sentence or two, the first sentence of an intelligence report, and you can read it, and if you want more, you can touch a button. And then more of the report would pop up. And then if you really like it, you could press another button, and then you could read every page of it. And then if you have a question, you could type it right in and get the question right to the analysts who can then get you an answer. What do you think? Uh, Kissinger gave it a pocket veto. He didn't even respond to it. Um, I found the memo in, in archives, I, I gave it to him, and I said, what, did you see this? What did you think of this when this happened? And he looks at me like I'm crazy, because honestly, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night, and I expect him to remember a memo he got 40-some years ago. <laughs> but, he, but he reads it, and, and, he's, and he just laughs. And he said, I, I wouldn't have even known what a computer was at that point. This would not have worked for us. So they didn't do anything with it. And in fact, no other president did anything to advance the technology of the president's daily intelligence report for more than 40 years until President Obama started getting his on an iPad. Now, what is the difference between getting intelligence analysis on an iPad versus paper? Not that much. It does enable a few things. It does enable you to get interactive graphics, a visual display of information instead of just words. It does allow you to have video that you can watch. Instead of just reading words about a foreign leader, you can see the video right there in real time instead of as a supplementary product later. But the goal of the briefings is still the same, to provide the President of the United States, who has to make the toughest decisions, with timely, objective, and hopefully accurate intelligence to help inform national security decisions. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, these are some of the stories that, that are in the book. I encourage you to look for more, but I encourage you to ask questions about more and ask me about them afterwards if you'd like. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll encourage you to move to the microphone so that everyone can hear the question. And then I will either answer the question or completely ignore it. Let's go ahead and see. At various points in the book, 
you uh, express the concern that the intelligence community has, and it seemed like sometimes on the White House side too, mm -hmm. about the politicization of the PDB and others. You mentioned Bob Gates' efforts and others. Mm -hmm. Is there like a firm line there mm -hmm. or it's easy to say, no, we've crossed that line and, and this is being politicized or is it just so obscure? Right. The, the concept of politicization is one that's often misunderstood. The politicization of intelligence is when intelligence analysts or officers in presenting the intelligence to decision makers take into account what the decision maker wants to hear. And that, that can go both directions. That can be, I know that the president wants to hear this and I want the president to like me. So I'm gonna tell the president what he wants to hear. But it can also go the other way, which is I know what the president wants to hear and, and I kinda like making him mad. I kinda like telling him that his policy sucks. I like this. <laughs> it could go both ways. Politicization is the cardinal sin of intelligence analysis. Intelligence analysts are trained. You do not change your conclusions based on the predilections of the customer. You can change the approach. You can change it from a written book to an iPad. You can change it from a written briefing to an oral briefing. But you don't change the actual analytic assessments within there. Has this always happened? Of course not. There have been times where some intelligence officers have wanted to be in the Oval Office a little too much and maybe have colored their assessments slightly. But overall, the track record is pretty good. From the interviews that I did, from the documentary research I was able to dig into, overall, that ethos of intelligence, which is give your best assessment to the customer, even if it's wrong, give the best assessment, has generally avoided the politicization. That is not to say that intelligence has always been right. The problem with the Iraq WMD, the best assessment of the analyst was it was there. Why would Saddam Hussein be denying inspections, running people out the back of a building when the inspectors go in the front door if he wasn't hiding something? They fit it into their preconceived notion. He had more WMD than we thought after the Kuwait invasion. Therefore, he's probably still hiding it now. Not a politicization error, just a simple error in analysis. Similarly, before the 1973 war, the intelligence assessment in the PDB was we're seeing some really big military exercises in Egypt, bigger than we've ever seen before, exceptionally realistic. But we don't think there's any threat to Israel. That was the message that was briefed literally as Egypt was invading Israel. It was disastrously and embarrassingly wrong. Not politicization, but an error of analysis. Thank you. After 9-11 and the run up to uh, the Iraq war, there was criticism of the, uh, the fact that the various security agencies of the government were not putting their heads together. They were not exchanging information. And it seems to me that you've represented the president's intelligence briefings as being an, uh, exclusively a CIA function. Mm -hmm. And that has not only the effect of excluding the DIA and the NSA and other security agencies of the federal government from the process, of providing the president information and insights, but also that it, it uh, deals exclusively with the international picture. And the FBI is not involved, for example. Many of the president's problems have not been in the international arena. Mm -hmm. They have been also domestic. Thank you. Let me address both sides of that, because there are two sides to that. One is the CIA versus the intelligence community, of which CIA is a part. And the other one is the domestic foreign divide. The first one, through most of its history, the President's Daily Brief was produced by the CIA. It always incorporated information from other intelligence agencies. Imagery, that is pictures taken from overhead. It included human intelligence sources. It included what's called SIGINT, or signals intelligence, the listening in on foreign communications. It included State Department cables. It included military reports and it included open source information, just reading foreign newspapers. All of that was included, but it was mostly CIA analysts doing the writing up of the assessments. Occasionally there would be input, but not regularly. That was just the way it was. Now, we shouldn't fool ourselves. The president wasn't only seeing the president's daily brief. Yes, that was the one-stop shopping, but no president treated it as the only input. Every president since John Kennedy had a situation room, and the situation room is constantly sending in 
raw intelligence and other information to the president. Also, each of the agencies you mentioned produce their own document. The State Department has a Bureau of Intelligence and Research, and they produce something called the Secretary's Morning Summary, a daily document geared for the Secretary of State but almost every modern president has also received that to get INRs, or the Intelligence and Research Bureau's information. Traditionally, the Defense Intelligence Agency has produced the Military Intelligence Digest, which has also often gone to presidents. So even before 9-11, even before the reforms after 9-11, there was always some community representation in the president's decision making, not in the PDB. That's where the fundamental change happened after 9-11. The PDB stopped being a CIA product it formally and officially became a product of the intelligence community as a whole, overseen by the new Director of National Intelligence, a position created about 10 years ago now. Now the PDB formally, systematically, and regularly incorporates intelligence and analysis from all elements of the intel community. Anybody in the intel community can write for the President's Daily Brief. It does not need to be a CIA officer. The CIA still produces most of the analysis and most of the briefers, but it is formally an intelligence community document. That's one side. That's the IC side. The other side of it is the foreign domestic divide. You hit it exactly right. Very rarely in PDB history that I was able to find did the PDB have anything we would call domestic, that is, within the U.S. borders. It was foreign intelligence. And CIA stayed out of that business, mostly. That was the FBI's purview, but the FBI did not play in the PDB. This was a disaster for something like 9-11, when the FBI had some information, CIA had some information, but the two did not have a process. And I tell the story in the book about how the President's daily brief that went to George W. Bush in August of 2001 that said, Bin Laden determined to strike in U.S., the most famous PDB article in history because it was declassified by the 9-11 Commission, and you can see it as it appeared for the President with only a couple of redactions. That piece was about the intent of bin Laden to strike in the US. The capability to do so within the US was virtually an afterthought and was done by a call from the CIA analyst who wrote it to an FBI colleague on the phone getting the information and then tossing it in at the end of the piece. Probably could have been done better. And the PDB since the reforms of the 9-11 Commission, the WMD Commission, and the creation of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the PDB now formally incorporates information from the FBI as an element of the wider intelligence community to cross that divide. Thank you. I was wondering if the presidential candidates also uh, get the briefings, and if right. so, uh, when, and who, how do you decide who? Right. And so forth. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's a bit of a backstory to presidential candidates receiving intelligence briefings. It goes back to Harry Truman. Harry Truman became president when FDR died. He had not been vice president very long. He came into office not even knowing that the Manhattan Project to create the atomic bomb existed. And he was determined that no other person should be in that situation again. So he offered candidates briefings before the actual election. Now, there's really two purposes there. One purpose is to make sure that nobody is caught completely by surprise and they don't have a steep learning curve when they begin in office. But another one is to avoid them saying something galactically stupid on the campaign trail. <laughs> something that puts either them or the other candidate in an awkward position. The ultimate example, 1960. Vice President Richard Nixon is running for president. So is the young Senator John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy is hammering Richard Nixon on the lack of support to Cuban exiles and saying, we really should be arming Cuban exiles to go back into Cuba and take over from the Castro regime. He has no clue that there is a covert action going on to do exactly that. That would eventually lead to the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. Richard Nixon as vice president does know this, but he can't talk about it because he knows how secret it is. So they wanted to avoid that in the future by offering to candidates the same briefing, not to politicize, but to give candidates the option to hear the same information, also helping them from hamstringing them if they do get into office. So those have been offered to all candidates since. Most, of, most candidates have taken them up on that. Something changes when the election happens. Then you have not two candidates, but you have, in a sense, two presidents. You have the current president and you have the president-elect. Traditional practice has been that upon the election, the president-elect is offered the president's daily brief. 
during the transition period to get up to speed on all the intelligence issues, to get used to receiving this document, to think about how he or she wants to receive it, they're brought into the PDB circle. That only created a real problem once, and that was in the year 2000. Because there was an election, and we still didn't know who the president-elect was. <laughs> this was not a problem for one of the candidates. Al Gore was vice president. He'd been getting the president's daily brief for eight years. It was a real problem for George W. Bush, governor in Texas. The agency had set up a whole operation to start briefing him the PDB if he was elected. They started twiddling their thumbs because they did not have authorization to start briefing him on it because the election was undetermined. This went on only for a short period of time before President Clinton wisely decided, I have to make sure that if he does become president, he doesn't start prepping for this on January 1st. So they brought him into the PDB briefing process a little bit earlier than anybody else had ever been brought in. There is one point here that's worth talking about for candidates in the election. Here we are in this election cycle. And as I wrote in the cipher brief online a couple of weeks ago, we have not heard in the 17,000 debates or the 14,000 town halls, we have not heard questions about how presidents are going to use their intelligence, how they're going to structure their intelligence briefings to make sure they get the best inputs possible. Nobody's asking that question and they're not telling us. Why does it matter? Because it gives us a window into the character of the president. It lets us know, are you going to take independent judgments that disagree from your own to help you get the ground truth around the world? Or are you going to dismiss it? That's an important question. And I think the presidential candidates should be telling us about that. Thank you. Just, just had a quick question about the mechanism itself. You mentioned that George W. Bush's briefer was with him all the time. Right. I'm curious about the mechanics of how that briefer got, right. the, got the information to deliver if he was with George Bush all the time. Uh, right. was, he, was he working 24 hours a day or was there some other kind of you know, people running in plays from the, from the sure. sideline? I, I, thank you. I can give you a little bit of insight into this because I was on the president's daily briefing staff. I did not brief the president in my role, but I briefed one of the handful of people that George W. Bush designated to also receive the PDB. Uh, two customers, in fact. What you do is, number one, if you're in Washington, you just get up really early. Typically, I would wake up midnight, one o'clock, go into the office, start reading the drafts of what was pr being printed in the book, read up on the supplementary information, call the actual smart people on the information I was briefing to find out what are the answers to these likely questions. My job was more of relationship management. I had to understand what my customers were going to ask before they even knew they were going to ask it so that I could get the answer to that question and avoid a long day of somebody writing a memo to answer something that I could do like that. So, but that's in Washington. Now, if you're traveling with your customer, that's not as easy to do. But there's a very extensive mechanism set up to provide information to the president when he travels. The whole idea of a president being on vacation is such a joke. Anywhere the president goes, there is such a movement of communications equipment, security, and everything else with him, the president is never on vacation. Same thing happens for the CIA briefer, now the intelligence community briefer. If the president wants to have a briefer, there is no doubt that those communication mechanisms are going to get the information to that briefer when the president wants the briefer to get it to be prepared for that session. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Two-part question. It seems like uh, there is a much more turnover of CIA directors. Uh, is there a st limitation how long tenure they can be? I mean, we are uh, who are was there for FBI for God, God knows how many decades. And the second part is looking forward now with uh, all the things going on in the world. How do you see the this uh, daily briefing change? Okay. Thank you. Two questions. First, uh, CIA directors term. There is no formal term for the CIA director, or for the director of national intelligence for that matter. Um, there are some discussions about that. You may have seen in the news recently, there's been a proposal for having a set term like the FBI director does have. Now, don't fool yourself. Those people still serve at the pleasure of the president. I don't care if there's a seven year term or a five year term. If that person falls out with the president, they're gone. So the whole idea of a term is a little silly anyway. But the idea is to try to disentangle the intelligence leadership from the administration. What we've had mo most recently is each president coming in and choosing a new director of central intelligence. That's not the way it used to be, but that's the way it's become now. You can easily see both sides of this argument. If I'm the president of the United States 
and I have a director of the Central Intelligence Agency or a director of national intelligence that I don't trust, that I don't know, I'm probably not going to have the, the frank relationship with that person that I need to make the best use of my intelligence. So maybe I want to pick my own person, someone I'm comfortable with, someone who I trust to tell me what they think even if I don't want to hear it. On the other hand, changing it every four years runs the risk of politicization because then you're pulling in somebody who probably thinks like you do or else you wouldn't choose them for that spot in the first place. So both sides have some merit and have some value. The second question about the, give me the details again about the daily brief. Look, going forward now, you know, the world has right. changed. Uh, when, what happened yeah. last night uh, in Brussels and what happened. Right. Yeah. The daily brief, here's the way I look at it, is it's the president's book. The president's going to get it any way he or she wants to get it. I could easily see a new president coming in and saying, I don't want, I don't want this anymore. That's not how I get information. I like to listen. This was President Ford. He came in, he told his advisors that very first morning, I learn better by listening than by reading. So I'm keeping this briefing on my schedule even though you're all clamoring to get time on my schedule. This wouldn't work. On the other hand, if you're somebody who processes information better by reading than by listening, you're gonna ask for some kind of, of written product. How do I see it evolving over time? Here's the real issue. The information getting into the President's Daily Brief, the information that analysts have to take into account is expanding dramatically. The amount of information out there, not just through big data and analytics, but the amount of collection available out there is massive. So the biggest problem is not necessarily do we have enough to tell the President today, but what do we absolutely have to tell the President today? Because there's so much stuff out there. You run the risk of not telling the president enough. You run the risk of leaving the president unprepared for a crisis if you don't brief him or her on the main issues of the day. You run just as much of a challenge on the other side, like John F. Kennedy had before the pickle was created, of getting too much information and simply not paying attention to it. So a lot depends on how good the intelligence community is at getting that narrow line between briefing enough but not too much, and then based on the personal preferences of the president himself or herself, how he or she wants to receive it. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone. Yes, please. The mechanism that he seems to have settled into, and I don't know, it may have changed this morning, but the, the, the mechanism he seems to have settled into is he receives the president's daily brief on the iPad, reads through it, talks with his advisors later, but regularly has the Director of National Intelligence or one of the deputies working under the Director of National Intelligence come in and talk with him about it. Now, if he's already read it, he doesn't want them to just rebrief what he's already read. So they probably would have to come in with some additional things, some alternative analyses, maybe walk in with some additional topics that he needs to know. So it's not technically a PDB briefing. It's not walking through exactly what's in that book that day, but it's a supplemental way of doing it. He, according to the schedules that the White House has released, he's not doing that every day, but he is doing that fairly regularly to get the in-person briefing on top of the document that he's reading. Thank you. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to talking to you outside. Uh, one moment, please, um, before we adjourn. Just want to thank our speaker for his wonderful presentation. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, we have a special gift, a pen set with President Ford's signature, oh. which you can use to sign books afterwards. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. And, and thank you all for your wonderful questions and for coming out tonight. Two quick upcoming program announcements. On Tuesday, April 12th, Luke Nichter, academic author and noted expert, on the Nixon tapes, we'll discuss a decade with the Nixon tapes, what we learned and what we have yet to learn, and he'll also explain why we are all here this evening. Uh, on Thursday, May 5th, we'll be hosting Joel Goldstein, noted expert on the Weiss presidency and constitutional law, who will discuss his new book, The White House Vice Presidency, The Path to Significance. Flyers for these programs are available outside the auditorium as are forums for joining Friends of Ford and our email announcements list.
Now I invite you to our reception where you can meet our speaker and get your books signed. Thank you all for coming out this evening.